All right, hello everyone. This is our class number 12. We are going to cover K nearest neighbors, KNN. Uh, this is a very, one of the most simple and well actually simplest, but yet uh, powerful machine learning models out there, which is uh, used extensively for classification. And then in some use case, there are some use cases for regression as well. So in this simple picture that you see the, the, on the left hand side, so let me see. On the left, you're looking at a classification example, and on the right, we're looking at the regression example. If you're going to open, we're going to talk about the details of either of the applications of KNN, um, either in classification or regression. But uh, for now, just in order to give you a big picture, when it comes to classification, we are classifying a new observation, right? So, for example, on the on the left, imagine I want to see this is my new test observation. I want to see the, what class does it uh, belong to. So is it class purple or class purple is class B or class A, which is the yellowish one, right? And then we have to figure out, okay, so for example, how many neighbors you wanna consider? Is it three neighbors or six neighbors? If you wanna think of three neighbors, so the answer is going to be, well, well, the majority is purple, so the answer is purple, right? If it is six neighbors, look at that. I have four of the orange ones here and only two of them two of the purple ones, so the answer is going to be class A. So you already see that depending on what value you pick for the K nearest neighbors, we, you may get completely different answer, right? So in this example, if K is equal to three, the answer is class B. If K is equal to six, the answer is class four. So you already know what are one of the caveats of K and N, which is you have to pick K um, beforehand. But there are ways to um, find that, uh, let's call it hyperparameter, we're gonna use cross-validation to find that hyperparameter. So this is classification. And we have X1, X2, and the colors are the outcome, right? Default, no default, class A, class B, and et cetera. On the right-hand side, we have, let's say this is my Y variable, this is my X variable. So, so the dimensionality of the, uh, of the regression on the right-hand side, uh, the feature space, the dimension for the feature space is one. It's not two. There is only one X and on the vertical axis, there is Y variable, right? And then let's say these are, these are the observations. Uh, you can think of, I don't know, there's a negative relationship between something. I don't know, for example, you can think of Y as a house price. So price of house. And then X maybe uh, is the distance from downtown, something like that, right? So maybe the closer to the downtown, the, the, the price is higher, something like that. But at the end of the day, KNN is going to give you this uh, line, so we don't call it regression. Well, you can call it regression line, but obviously it's not, it's uh, nonlinear, right? It's not going to be nonlinear at all. So the fit and the model for KNN is going to be nonlinear. All right, so that, that was a big picture of KNN in classification and regression. So let's, let's look at the details of each of these uh, applications, right? So where we are, we are still in this supervised learning uh, section of the course. And uh, now we are covering the KNN. We talked about linear, linear and polynomial regression, penalized regression, logistic regression, which was used for classification. And now we're going to talk about KNN, uh, which is used for both uh, classification and regression. Okay. So today we are going to talk about what's behind the scene for the KNN classification. And we'll talk about the performance metrics. And, usually the standard performance metric for classifications, right? Accuracy, precision, error rates, and et cetera, F1 score. And the choice of K, we're gonna use cross-validation to come up with uh, what is the correct number for K, which is going to optimize our objective function. And uh, we're gonna talk about the objective function in KNN because if you read the literature, people say that there is no loss function, and that's true, there is no loss function in KNN. But still, there's something you look into to optimize, right? To figure out what is the best K. Uh, well, sorry, to, to train the model. Uh, but the training part is, is a slightly different. We will talk about that one later on. In part two, uh, we will be talking about what's behind the scene for KNN regression. Again, the big picture is, was super easy and straightforward. We, know, uh, we, we look at, basically, we look at the neighbors and figure out, uh, said, what's the average value for observations around the, uh, let's say, a neighborhood of five observation and report that number. But we're going to open up that, uh, uh, that optimization problem as well. Then we will talk about KNN versus linear regression. So this, this is a really interesting topic, right? Because in practice, KNN is 
very, very rarely used for regression analysis. It is widely used for classification, but it's not uh, commonly used for regression. And there's a reason for that. We're gonna talk about it by comparing it to our simple linear regression model and see why that's the case. And of course, we're gonna talk about performance metrics in regression for in K and regression and the choice of K, the same story. And then finally, part three, we will talk about curves of dimensionality. So the, the curves of dimensionality is a problem that applies to any kind of machine learning, but the performance of KNN is exacerbated when the, when the dimensionality is, is high. So we, we call it curves of dimensionality specifically for, uh, for KNN models, uh, KNN yeah, yeah, al uh, algorithm. And finally, we're gonna conclude the, with pros and cons of KNN. There's a chance that I cannot cover part three today, but we'll see how far we can go. Uh, if not, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm going to cover it next class. All right. Are we good in terms of big picture? Okay, so let's start with the uh, part one classification. So as we said earlier, KNN is one of the simplest and best known non-parametric supervised learning technique. It is non-parametric, why? Because we are not imposing any restriction to the, mo to the model, right? So you're, you're not saying that, for example, Y is equal to uh, beta zero plus beta one X plus beta two X two and et cetera. So you're not imposing any kind of restriction, right? So it's, it's a non-parametric uh, and it's supervised uh, technique. And it, as I said, it is most often uh, used for classification. And the idea is very simple. The idea is to classify a new observation, let's call it X test by finding similarities. So this is key term. We're gonna revisit this term similarities or nearness in, in our future um, uh, uh, machine learning models as well. But similarity of two, between two points is basically what's the distance between the two, right? If distance is small, we call it they're similar to each other. If the distance is large, we call it they're dissimilar. They're, they're not similar to each other. So it's, it's a measure of nearness, right? And uh, basically that new observation that you're, you're studying, we wanna see how close is that observation to the two neighbors, three neighbors, five neighbors, and et cetera, right? Depending on what is that number of K. Okay. Uh, all right, so, so let's actually, let's start with this one to, to, that we already talked about. Imagine this is our uh, X in the test set and we, let's, let's start from scratch. Let's say we wanna classify it. Is, it. is it purple or is it yellow, right? So if K is equal to three, you can see the answer is class B, right? I, I can give you more context. So for example, imagine here X1 is income, X2 is our monthly balance, right? And so it seems that if K is equal to three for this, for this observation in the test set, and let's say class B, the purple is default. Default in the credit card, on the credit card, right? So if K is equal to three, well, obviously this new observation is going to be classified as default, right? Because, because of what? Because if I look at the neighborhood, so I define the neighborhood as this circle. Now, we're, gonna, we're gonna talk about that neighborhood measure of similarity in more details. But as of now, think, think of it as, let's draw a circle and see and count the numbers, right? Uh, within that circle. So for example, here we have a circle and within the circle, two of them are purple, one is yellow. So the answer is going to be purple because the majority within that neighborhood is going to be purple, right? Or default. So there are two things that are going on here. So I, I have to pick two things. Number one is my K. What is K? Is it three? Is it five? Is it six? Is it one? And number two, what is, what is my distance metrics? Right? So for most commonly people use Euclidean distance metrics when it comes to K and N. But there are different metrics out there. So we have, you know, we talked about L1 norm, L2 norm previously, right? So L1 was Manhattan norm. So we have the same ideas here. We have Manhattan distance, we have Minkowski distance, we have Euclidean distance, but, and they have, either of them has different shapes, right? So for example, Euclidean distance, we define it as circle. Manhattan distance is a, something like a trapezoid. We're gonna look at them in Wikipedia in a second. But for now, uh, whenever you're, just remember, when you're dealing with KNN, either classification or regression, you have to decide two things before running the model. Number one, what is K? Number two, what is your distance metrics? So these are the hyperparameters 
the model, right? So, so there are two hyperparameters here, the distance matrix and K, number of uh, observations in neighborhoods, right? All right, so unlike other machine learning models, the KNN keeps all the training example in memory. So that for that reason, we call it, it's lazy. So it's not like linear regression or logistic regression that you use a train set, you train the model, you come up with the weights like W stars and V star, and then you're done with the train set, right? Because you have the W stars and V star, and then next step, you use the new observation in the test set, you only use the W and V star and then make a prediction. In KNN, there is no parameter. There are hyperparameters, don't mix these things, right? The hyperparameter is K, but there is no parameter to be estimated. So for that reason, for every single observation that you wanna make prediction, the, the model, the machine learning model is going to go through the entire train set and then make prediction for the new observation. Does that make sense? So for that reason, we call this model, this algorithm in general to be lazy. And, and you, you can guess if the sample size is large, this algorithm is going to be slow as well. Because each time when you give it a new observation in the test set, it has to go through the entire observations in the train set and tell you what's the prediction, okay? So that's, that's what we say, the, the canon in general is lazy or it has to keep all the training examples in memory. All right. So the choice of distance metrics as well as the value for K, we already talked about it, right? These are the choices that the analysts, you as an analyst, you have to make a decision before running the algorithm. So these are hyperparameter. So guys, remember, uh, if I tell you that if someone asks you, there's no parameter in KNN, yes, there is no parameter in KNN, but there are hyperparameters, actually two of them, K and the distance metrics. All right. And you see how the output is, uh, is sensitive to, the, to K, right? So in this example, if K is equal to three, the answer is uh, default. If K is equal to six, the answer is no default or class A. Right, so that was that was the the uh, basically the definition of KNN classification. Now let's see what are the steps, right? So there are five uh, specific steps that you need to take. Well, well, the machine is going to take behind the scene, right? Uh, in order to figure out what are the predictions. So the first one is choose the number of neighbors. K. It's a positive integer. So the good news is that uh, our Hyperparameter is discrete here. So we can use cross-validation and at the end of the day tell what is the, we can numerically plot it and then to find the optimal value of K, right? It's, it's not like lasso and the ridge regression that the hyperparameter was continuous. Here, the hyperparameter is discrete, which is good news, right? It can be one, two, three, and et cetera. So let's say, uh, I don't know, imagine I wanna make a prediction for, let's say this, this is my X in the test set, uh, the red one. I wanna make predictions, right? And so the first thing I need to figure out is my K. Let's say if K is equal to, so I, I can say if K is equal to one, well, imagine this is a circle just at the center of the circle, right? If this is, this is if K is equal to one, well, there's overlap here. Well, if K is equal to one, the outcome is going to be blue, right? for this observation. And if the K is equal to, let, let's increase that number. Let's increase it to six, maybe. Yeah, let me see if I, let me see if I can plot that. So let's say this is K is equal to, again, imagine these are circles, right? <laughs> for the sake of argument. So imagine K is equal to five. I'm gonna go ahead and erase this one. So now K is equal to five. Oops, I don't know why. All right, so K is equal to five. So this is step number one, choose your K. Again, at the end of the day, we, have, we can optimize this K, but X ante, you have to come up with some number. Let's say five. Choose the distance metrics. So in general, the distance metrics is we use for K and then we use Euclidean distance. And Euclidean distance means basically circles. Guys, if I tell you that this is point A, this is point B, right? What is the distance between A and B? You're gonna say like this. So for example, I have, imagine this is A squared. This is, this is my A, this is my B. So what is this one? This is going to be my square root of A squared plus B squared. So this is Euclidean distance, right? So this basically means that any point on this circle has the same distance from A. Is that clear everyone, right? So, so the Euclidean distance, 
if you want to plot the contours, it's going to be circles, a bunch of circles. So you have to pick your distance metrics. So let's say if your distance metrics is Euclidean distance, we're going to work with circles. If it is Manhattan, we're going to work something like this. And if it is Minkowski, depending on what's value of P, we come with different uh, shapes, right? So let me quickly show you Uh, let's see if I can, oh, did I close it out? Okay. All right, so this is a Wikipedia. Uh, oh, today's Women's Day. By the way, congratulations to all the women here in the class and at home. <laughs> so uh, this, is, this is the definition for Minkowski distance, right? So basically in general, so this, uh, let me see. Do you see my cursor? No, you don't see it there. So the, if, you, if you go over the definitions, there's this the distance between X and Y, D open close parenthesis X and Y. So that's the distance between two, uh, two points uh, in any dimension of space, right? So it's going to be equal to absolute value of X minus Y to the power of T, uh, uh, P, and the, the entire thing, the summation to the power of one divided by P. It's not that complicated. So if you replace P with one, you get your Manhattan distance, right? So look at that, P is equal to one here. This is our Manhattan distance. You're all familiar with this one, L1 norm. If P is equal to, uh, in this case, is equal to two, this is our Euclidean distance, right? If P is equal to, let's say, oh, I don't know, 2.82, something like this. It's a combination of L1 and L2 norm, like in, in our elastic net regression. Do you remember those things? And uh, uh, so we can have this kind of shapes, this shape, or maybe this shape, or again, in most application for KNN, we work with circles. So when I say that you have to come up with your distance metrics, basically we are, we, you wanna realize that what kind of shape you wanna use to figure out what are the, what are the uh, nearest neighbors. Are we looking at the circles? Are we looking at squares or what? Okay. So let's say in this example, we picked our Euclidean distance. So we are going to deal with circles, right? So for, that's why I draw a circle here. Okay. So next step, uh, the next step, identify the K points in the training data uh, that are closest to the uh, XTE. This is our X in the test set, the, the red dot, the red dot, right? And this neighborhood, we can represent it by N null or N zero. So this is our neighborhood null. So basically we identify the points that are inside that neighborhood, right? So if K is equal to five, so I have five of these uh, dots here. So one, two, three, four, and there is one uh, orange there, which is five, okay? So let me see if I can undo. Well, I hope that I didn't mess with that. Anyways, so set number four. After, uh, after you came up with your, your K and distance metrics, and then you define that neighborhood, you have to calculate the conditional probabilities, right? So the conditional probability that class is orange given feature space. Conditional probability that class is, let's say blue given feature space, conditional probability that class is equal to, let's say green given the feature space, right? So for example, let's talk about, let's calculate the conditional probabilities here. So base, I'm gonna say, what is the probability? What is the probable? What is the probability of class? Uh, uh, let's call this one class orange. Class orange given X test. Is this notation clear to everybody? I, I'm going to say that what is the probability that the class is going to be orange given your observation is test set. This, this X test, this is our X in the test set. So what is the answer to this one, conditional probability? So how many, how many dots we have in this neighborhood, N0? How many dots we have in this neighborhood, N0? So here we have four blues and one orange. Does everyone see that? Okay, so four blues, one orange. So what is the conditional probability of uh, the outcome is orange? One fifth, right? Four blue, one orange. So there are five observations. So the probability is one fifth. Okay, so what is the conditional probability that the class is and blue and given X test, given that observation. So what, what's the answer to this one? Four fifths, right? 
And finally, what is the conditional probability that the class is green given X in the test set? What is the answer to that one? Zero, right? Okay, so this is our set number four. We calculate the conditional probabilities within that neighborhood that we define based on the number of K, okay? So now you have to compare these numbers. Then you have to, by looking at these numbers, you have to classify that red dot. So what is the, what is the outcome to this? Uh, if this is, if, if those are the numbers, conditional probabilities, what's the answer? What's the class of the, green, the, the red dot? You're going to classify it as what, the, what color? Blue, right? Because it has the highest conditional probability, the largest conditional probability. So that's your step number five. So in step number five, we classify the test observation XTE uh, to the class with the largest probability. So not surprisingly, uh, we can come up with probably the outcome of this model can be probabilities as well. Do you remember in logistic regression, the outcomes were probabilities, 80%, 60%. And then we came up with that threshold. We said, if, th if it is greater than 50%, call it one. If it is less than 50%, call it zero. We have exactly the same output here. The output of the KNN classification are, pro are probabilities. Then you define a threshold, and then based on that threshold, you're going to classify them. Exactly the same thing that we did in logistic regression. Okay, so remember, guys, the output, the outcome of the KNN classifications are uh, probabilities. Okay, so for example, if the answer here is four fifth, eighty percent. Now, if the threshold is fifty percent, it's going to be classified as let's say the color is blue. If it is eighty percent, something else. Right. Okay, here we have three classes, uh, which is going to make it a little more challenging. But think of the example of two classes: default, no default, and etc. Okay. So we can classify the red dot with the blue ones because the blue ones are the highest, highest probability. probability within that neighborhood. Yeah, depending on your k. K here was five, and so forth. And you use the Euclidean distance. Given all those conditions, yes, we chose, we picked, we classify it as blue because it has the highest conditional probability. So this conditional probability, actually, this is our objective function, right? So at the end of the day, you're going to maximize the conditional probabilities. But in practice, you know, if you talk to practitioners, people know that can, in KNN, there is no loss function. And literally, there is no loss function. There is no, there is no optimization problem out there that you go over it, either use gradient descent or linear algebra, et cetera, to come up with a closed form solution. There is no loss function. However, you're maximizing something, at least locally. These are the neighborhoods. Within each neighborhood, you're maximizing the conditional probability. Is that clear? And as you can see, there is, there is no functional form here. I'm just looking at everything is done visually, right? There's no functional form. And when I say visually, I mean, there's a Euclidean distance. You, can, you count those things. And it's, it's very simple. The algorithm is very simple. And there is absolutely no functional form out there. So what does that mean? It means that, do you think that KNN is interpretable? If you want to rank it between zero and 100, what's the interpretability of KNN? What's your best guess? Do you have any parameters at the end of the day? No. So what do you think is the interpretability of KNN in scale of zero to 100? So make a guess. Zero, right? You, can, you, can, you cannot interpret anything out of KNN. Does that make sense? You, the only thing you can do with KNN is predictions. Because there's nothing to interpret. There's no parameter. Let's say, if, if I increase this by this amount, what will happen to that one? Nothing. Okay, so canon is not interpretable at all. But it's the predictable. When it comes to predictability, it's, it's a powerful model. It's surprisingly, even though it's simple, it's, it's a very powerful model. When it comes to classification. All right. No now, question. yep. So if K is, let's say, 3 versus K is 5, and the value of K, what meaning does it have? And what what, what are we well, saying? Well, if K is equal to three versus five versus six and et cetera, so it's going to affect your, your outcome, right? So it's going to affect, so for example, at the end of the day, you wanted to call this one either purple or orange, right? If your K, well, let, let me give you an example. If K is equal to one, which one is the closest neighbor? Probably orange, right? So probably this one is the closest one. So if k is equal to one, the outcome is going to be a class A. Do you see that? If k is equal to three, the outcome is going to be, because the probability is two third, the outcome is going to be class B. 
if k is equal to six, the outcome is going to be one, two, three, four, five, six, a four, six, which is class A, right? At the end of the day, we have a performance matrix. And you're going to plot K versus performance metric and pick the, pick the K, which is going to minimize what, whatever metric you're going to look into. If it is error rate, you want to minimize the error rate. If it is accuracy, you want to maximize the accuracy. Yep. So K is a hyperparameter that we choose, yep. right? And then also K is essentially, it's just how big the radius of. Exactly, the exactly, exactly, yeah. exactly. If your distance metric is Euclidean, if it is Manhattan, how big that is square is, if it is depending. But again, I think the application maybe 90, 90, 95 plus ninety five percent Euclidean distance is used in in, uh, in practice. For some applications, people use Manhattan distance. I'm going to give you some examples, Speci specifically when there are uh, categorical features. We're going to look at the examples uh, by the end of the class today. Uh, all right, so now let's talk about the decision boundary. Do you remember, let me actually remind you yeah, of an example in regression analysis. So for example, here were the cross, you know, maybe stars, we have two classes and we had circles, right? So of course there's a circle here, there's a cross here. Do you remember the logistic regression was able to do something like this? Okay, so this was the decision boundary. We're gonna do exactly the same thing with KNN, right? We wanna, we wanna plot this decision boundary in KNN. And we're sure you're gonna see that in two dimension, the visualization is, we, we can see that. It is very powerful, right? Because it's non-parametric. It can be anything. That boundary can be anything, literally anything, right? You don't need to have a functional form for that. So for that reason, it's very powerful. Let's look at an example. Imagine, uh, look, look at these very simple example here on the left. There are two classes. There are blue and orange circles, right? And there's a, a black, the, the black cross is our test observation. So this guy, which I turned it to red, is our, is our test observation, right? So let me leave it as black. Okay, so the black cross is a test of, you, you wanna classify that, right? So if K is equal to three, what is going to be the outcome? The outcome is going to be blue or orange? It's going to be blue, right? If K is equal to one, what's the outcome? orange and yeah if k is equal to two okay it's a good question if k is equal to two what's the outcome well no no if k is equal to two so most probably this is well should be a smaller than the other one right this is k is equal to two it uh, so the within the circles there's one blue one orange so what's the output yep what is this go with whatever one is we can do that, but usually the algorithm, it's a very good point, but usually the algorithm will pick randomly oh, okay. because it's easy to, to, to visualize it in two dimension, but in higher dimension, but it's a good one. So it, the algorithm pick it randomly, uh, but you can optimize it as well. So very good observation. So if K is equal to three, the outcome is, go, is going to be called to blue. Okay. And now in order to come up with a decision boundary, we have to repeat this process for literally every single available dot in the, let's say in this space, right? So imagine this is my space, uh, X1, X2, and I, I'm making up some numbers, right? So after scaling the features, I say, okay, maybe between minus four and four, maybe between, so X1 is between minus four and four, and X2 is also between minus four and four. Doesn't make sense after standardization. So the odds that, we see an observation outside this minus four and four, it's just going to be very small because it's eight sigma. Does that make sense? Right. So imagine this is the scale version of our space. And then at the end of the day, I can literally pick any dots here and classify it, right? So imagine K is equal to three. This dot is going to become blue. Does everyone see that? So blue, blue, blue. Are you following? All of, if K is equal to three, all of these, uh, observations in the tests are going to be blue. Do you agree that all these ones are going to be blue? What about this one? Orange, right? Okay, very good. Orange, 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 and et cetera. And maybe when I come to here, this is going to be tricky. Maybe at to, to some point they're orange, but from some point they're going to be blue. Do you see that? So if you repeat this exercise for, for literally every single available observation in our feature space, you come up with the decision boundary. This is our decision boundary. Right. So what you see here, actually, let's, let's read through it. 
So K and decision boundary uh, is shown in black. And I want you to compare this one, this decision boundary with this one. Well, well with this one that we had in logistic regression. They're very different, right? Which one is super flexible? The K and N, right? And, and it's, it's really, it's fascinating that how powerful is that as well. It's specifically, if your, you know, if your observations you know, are, are all over, all over the place. So if I wanna do the same job with uh, logistic regression, maybe, I don't know, I don't know how it works, but maybe it's something like this. And there are lots of misclassifications going on there. Right, but KNN is very powerful uh, uh, in order to separate these areas from each other. Yes, David. So real world example, which we talked about using logistic regression when we're talking about like default, not default. When would you use KNN? Same example. Regression? Yeah, same example. Default, not default, and X one and X two are your features. So X one is monthly balance, X two is your income, and then you're going to a KNN is able to classify them. But the decision boundary is going to be more rigid, let's say. It's more flexible. And that the decision boundary itself depends on the K as well. So we're, we're going to look at some examples, both for classification and regression. That if I change the K, I'm making, for example, if I increase the K, I'm making the model less flexible. So the decision boundary is going to become smoother and smoother. Okay. So here, the blue grid, so this, these are the blue grids, right? So the blue grids indicates the region in which a test observation will be assigned to a blue class. So these are basically the predictions. So the blue grids are the Y hats and uh, Y hats, which is blue here, Y hat is equal to orange. Is that clear? And this is my decision boundary. Okay, so decision boundary. And as you can see, it's absolutely nonlinear. Okay, so the fit is nonlinear too. Okay, so uh, unlike the logistic regression. Logistic regression, the model was linear, but the fit could be linear or nonlinear. So here is a linear fit, here is a nonlinear fit. But for KNN, the fit is always nonlinear. And the model is non-parametric. For non-parametric model, it doesn't make sense to necessarily say that linear, nonlinear. Is that clear? Okay, because there's no parameter. All right, now let's talk about performance metrics. So. Usually for KNN, uh, people report error rate instead of accuracy, but you, you know that it's one minus accuracy, right? So one minus accuracy is error rate. And the reason that people do the error rate is that it count, it literally summarizes the number of incorrect classifications, right? Or basically counting the number of misclassifications. So let me actually remind you of the definition of accuracy and our friend confusion matrix. So basically, uh, in error rate is counting the number of errors, misclassifications. These are bad numbers, right? False positive, false negative, these are bad numbers. So basically whenever Y is not equal to Y hat, so that your model is misclassifying. So this uh, error rate basically says that count them, take the average, right? So the error rate is the basically average error, uh, well, average number of misclassifications in the entire data set, or equivalently is equal to one minus accuracy, okay? Uh, a good classifier is the one for which the test error is the smallest, right? We don't care about the train, uh, the performance metric in the train set. We only care about the performance metric in the test set. And uh, like any other classifier, uh, if the data is highly imbalanced, uh, then we should use F1 score, precision recall, instead of the error rate. Uh, oh, when I was looking at your homeworks, even though in the data set, I think uh, the ratio was around 25%, something like that, and some of you guys says that the, the data is highly imbalanced. Uh, no, maybe I didn't. Maybe I, I didn't talk about it. So you have time to fix your answer uh, by the end of tonight, right? Um, maybe this is the right time to talk about it. If if your target variable is 2080, it is relatively balanced, especially if your sample size is large. If your if your target variable is 3,097, that's imbalanced. 4,96%, 2,98%. But 2080 is not that bad. 25, 75 is not that bad, right? So if it is 2080, let's call it relatively balanced, not imbalanced, okay? Uh, because guys, remember, imagine you have 1 million observation, 20% of that 1 million observation is a lot, it's 200 observations, this is awesome for making predictions in the model. But if it is only 1%, compared to 1 million, it's nothing, okay? Uh, 
Uh, and again, if, if the data, if the target variable is highly imbalanced, we have to report the F1 score, rely on F1 score more than the accuracy or the error rate because of all those things that we discussed in our previous classes. All right. Now let's talk about the choice of K. We have already talked about what is, how it is going to impact your prediction, uh, the outcomes. Now let's see how we can optimize that. The, the story is an older story. It's talking about bias versus variance. So let's talk about the, the, the trade-off between the two one more time. So imagine K is equal to one. And uh, well, actually let's look at the model. Let's look at the data. Imagine again in two dimension, you have X1 and X2. And imagine at the end of the day, this is your uh, decision boundary, right? And when K is equal to one, the model is super flexible, or you can call it super complex. So when the model is super complex, uh, what is your bet? Is the bias high or low? The bias is low, right? Because the model is complex. And the variance is going to be huge because what if you use another sample or test set? And look at this funny, overfitting here. So in the train set, there is one observation which is red there. And then when you set K is equal to one, the algorithm is, ag is able to pick that neighborhood, right? Can perfectly do the job because, in the, because uh, K is equal to one. So this is absolutely overfitting here. When K is equal to one, right? This, this is ridiculous, right? Because if I pass another uh, test set to that, there's a good chance that nothing is going to be inside this red shaded area, right? So this is clearly a sign of overfitting. So when K is equal to one, the model is super complex. The bias is small, but the variance is, uh, yeah, bias is small and the variance is high, okay? Now let's increase K. If I increase, if I go from K is equal to one to five, I'm making the model, be careful, I'm making the model less complex less flexible. The most flexible model in KNN is when K is equal to one. If I increase K, I'm making the model less flexible. If I make the model less flexible in general in machine learning, what will happen to bias? Yes, the bias increase. Uh, uh, so this is bad news, but the good news is that the variance is going to decrease because your decision boundary is becoming smoother and smoother. And actually when we go from K is equal to one to five, we get rid of this one. We get rid of this red shaded area. Right, because within that neighborhood, the algorithm is counting five of the neighbors. So if you do if you do five and calculate the probabilities, it's going to be always blue, not red. It's going to become red only if the neighborhood is equal to one. Right? K is equal to one. Right. Now let's keep adding to the k. Let's k is equal to nine, and as you can see, the decision boundary is becoming more and more smooth. So it used to be something like this, and now it's more smooth. Right. So as you can guess, um, if we incre if we increase the K, the variance is going to become smaller, but on the other hand, you're losing some, uh, you're adding some bias to the model as well. Okay. So here's how we pick the optimal value for K. So I can plot error rate versus K. In practice, again, in, in, in Python next class, I'm gonna show you that I prefer to put K instead of error rate, but I understand why people put one over K because they want to be consistent with, uh, when we go from left to right, the model is becoming more complex, right? Does everyone see that when I go from left to right, if, if I work with one over K instead of K, the model is becoming more complex because here, K is equal to one, the most complex model here, what is K here? 100, right? So K, K is equal to 100. So again, most complex, most complex. Well, actually, let me write it. When we go from left to right, we are making the model more flexible. Uh, more flexible. All right. Okay. Now, there are two things that we can report. We can report the trained errors and the test errors. So, I want you to focus on the train errors first. This this greenish or bluish, whatever color is that. Look at look at the look at the train errors. Do you agree that if k goes from hundred to one, if you make the model more complex, the train error is going to reduce? If k is equal to one, what is the train error? You can calculate that. Zero. Right? Because look look at the example here. When k is equal to one, everything is classified perfectly. 
even that strange dot here, because k is equal to one. So the train error is zero. So is this a, is this a good way to come up with a good metric to come up with the opti optimal value for k? Of course, the answer is no. You have to look at the test error, right? So then we can look at the test error and then see where it is minimized. So maybe here is where the test error is minimized. Maybe, yeah, I don't know, something. So here, k is equal to 10. Here, k is equal to 20. Maybe k is equal to 15. Maybe. Or even, yeah. does that make sense? Yep. Is there kind of like a general rule of thumb that you want to make k as small as possible given these parameters? So like in this example, wouldn't you want to pick the, the uh, test errors that are minimized, but if they're about the same, then furthest to the right? Oh, 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 very, very good question. So basically you're asking, which one is the case? K is equal to 15 or K is equal to, let's say 25, right? Yeah. So, no, K is equal, yeah, wait. Sorry, a smaller one. Yeah, you're right. Maybe this is 15, this is like, eh, like, like nine. So, okay. So I'll pick when K is equal to 15. So I'll give you the answer, you think about it. So the answer is 15. So why do you think that's the case? If everything is, else is con the same, and to hear the, the error rates, you pick the simpler model. Wouldn't the simpler model be the lower K though? No, K is equal to one is the most complex model. Oh, okay, yeah. Okay. So for that reason, yeah, for that reason, I prefer to work with K instead yeah. of one over K. Yeah. But again, I understand why people use one over K because they want to be consistent and you go from left to right. Again, it, it's, it's just a choice. Uh, I don't know, it's, it's subjective. I prefer to work with K. My Python, Python codes are going to, you, you're going to see K, but in different textbooks, you may see different things. Uh, but very good question. So you, if, if everything else is the same, so here in this example, the error rate in the test set is the same when K is equal to 15 and nine, I'll pick when K is equal to 15 because that's a simpler model. Yeah. Yeah. All right. And well, to be fair, I will not look at either of them, either the train errors or the test errors. What is the best one? cross-validated error, right? So we're gonna look at, uh, which, which is going to be somewhere in between the two. Uh, in Python, we're gonna look at the cross-validated error, okay? Because we're gonna, we're gonna work with cross-validated errors because of two things. First of all, you don't wanna cheat completely by looking at the train error. This is completely cheating. The model has seen everything, the data, so and then optimizing over that seen data doesn't make any sense. And on the other hand, uh, it is going to be more fair to work with cross-validation because again, the model hasn't seen the, the data there and there's a chance that the test set is not labeled, right? You wanna make predictions for future. Let's say, what if the test set is not labeled? So you have to use the cross-validation errors. Does that make sense? So for those two reasons, always, when you're uh, tuning out hyperparameters, we're gonna work with the, uh, the cross-validated version of the metrics, performance metrics. Good. All right, so that was our classification. Is there any question about the classification here? Let me actually ask you one last question. Imagine we have, this is a tricky question. Let's say we have 36 red dots and we have 30 blue dots. Is everybody following? So this is the data. If K is equal to 66, what does the model always predict? Right? Does everyone see that? So if K is equal to the, the number is equal or greater than the number of points in the sample size in the train set, the Canon classification is basically always predict one class. So that's where the imbalance data is going to play an important role. Okay. Yes. Yep, Ryan. Like I understand what you just said, but why why is it if K is equal to the number of observations? Like I, I thought K is just kind of like a radius, it's not- Yeah, it is a radius, yeah, it's a, it's a good question. So if, if I, imagine I wanna classify this point. Mm -hmm. If K is equal to six to six, what is that radius? I mean, it's gonna be really big. No, no, here, here, that's the radius because you are going to expand the radius until all the observations are inside that circle. So for that reason, 
for that reason. And then you count the probabilities. The probability of red is 36 divided by 66. The probability of blue is going to be 30 divided by 66. The model is going to always predict 36 divided by 66, which depending on the threshold, if it is 50%, we're gonna call it always red. So K isn't just like a, a, an arbitrary like unit of measure. It's oh, it's based not... off of how many- Exactly, so maybe I, sh I should have been more clear. Yeah, I should have been more clear, yeah. So you don't, you don't increase the radius arbitrarily. Yeah. You increase it until the number of observations within that N null not neighborhood is Could equal to, exactly equal to K. Okay. Exactly, okay. Good, good point, yeah. yeah. Thanks for clarification. Yes. So continuing with that example, if we have 10 data points that have not, that we are testing and the, the model won't then store, once we classify the first of those 10, it won't store that value because then that would affect like the next value. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it will never, yeah, it's a good point. So it's going to make predictions based on individual observation and test set. So if you add the 11th observation, it's a test set. So you keep the 10 observation in the train set and then you're done with the 11th observation, the 11th prediction, you just get rid of it. And you wanna make the prediction for the 12th observation, just look at the 10 uh, observations in the tra train set. Very good point. Isn't there another, uh, um, I, I can't even think of like classification type, like like K and M or regression that does that though, where it bases it off of like as it reads the test data. Uh, no, because that's cheating. Okay. Because you're leaking information. Well, for exactly for that reason, you're using cross violation. Okay. So regardless of the method in machine learning, you never you want to contaminate it. You, you, you never want the model to observe something from the test set okay. for the future predictions because that's, that's cheating. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right, so good discussion. So now let's talk about KNN regression, okay? So the idea of KNN regression is very similar to KNN classification. You basically, you have to count the number of, uh, I don't know, points in the neighborhood that you define. But now instead of, calculating the conditional probabilities, you're doing something like this. You're taking the average, so this is very simple. Again, guys, remember your, your target variable is continuous now, right? So the, now you wanna make predictions. For example, W is, you know, let's say this is house price. And X is number of miles from school. So number of miles from school. And the, Imagine these are scaled. And by scale, I mean, I, I did the mean max scale instead of standardization because there's only one feature here. And imagine at the end of the day, I get one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And then one, two, imagine X is miles. So one mile from school, two miles from a school, and et cetera. Three, four, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, maybe 13. Uh, so what is your what is your prior belief? So what, what should be the relationship between miles from school and how home price? Uh, Positive, negative? It should be made negative, right? Negative. Yeah, yeah, as miles increases, house price will drop. Yeah, uh, but what if you're right close to the school? That's that should negatively impact it. Imagine you know this is imagine this is a school. The, so this is a school. The price of this house should be very, very low because it's right close to school, right? So, and then if you increase the distance, the price is going to increase. And then from some points, the price is going to decrease. Do you see that nonlinearity discussion here? Does, does that seem... So for example, you believe it's something like this. If you're very close to the school, so maybe the, the price is very small, a very low and then increase up to some point and then again, it decreases, right? Again, if you believe that's the case, if you believe that the true relationship between house price and the miles from school is nonlinear, then KNN regression is going to do a good job. And we're gonna talk about that example, numerical example here, okay? And linear regression is going to do a very bad job, especially at the tails, right? So let's, let's look at, let's work with some numbers here. So what I have here in my text is, Let's say two miles and six. So let's say this is one observation. And we are gonna work with five simple observations, four and eight. 
So four and eight, six and eight, then let's say 10 and five. So this is our 10 and five, 10 miles and the price, again, price can be a scale of anything, 500,000, whatever. And then the last one is 13 and two. So let's say 13 and two. So imagine in real world, you only see these five numbers, right? You have no idea what's the true relationship between them. If you believe that the true relationship is linear, uh, how does the on, well, on it doesn't work like this. I don't have the choice of undo when it comes to annotating here. But anyway, if you believe that the relationship is linear, you would be better off working with linear regression model, right? But if you believe that the, the true relationship in that this discussion that we had here, you know, the home price is going to decrease and it's going to be small and then get larger and then get smaller, right? If you believe that there is nonlinearity in true relationship, then you should come, you should work with polynomial regression models or KNN, right? So, so yeah. So would KNN regression be similar to logistic regression? Logistic regression, we use logistic regression only for classification. Oh, okay. This is literally regression. So look at that. Look at your target variable. The target variable is continuous. Yeah. Logistic regression, the target variable are classes. Zero, one, two, three, and et cetera, right? Okay, so imagine, just for the sake of argument, imagine the true relationship between, uh, between our observations is like this. Right, this red line is not observable. Okay, so the only thing observable in the real world are the five single uh, red dots. Right, and now I should use another color. So nope, nope. Let's try. It. Okay. No. <laughs> I don't know how can I exit this one. <laughs> okay, stop. <laughs> Oh my goodness, no. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the whiteboard is, the annotation on the whiteboard is a lot easier, but this one. Okay, I just want to change the color. Please cooperate with me. Yay. Okay, so now let's say we want to make prediction if mile is eight. So this is my X in the test set. And by the way, what is the dimension of the feature space here? One, two, three. What is the dimension of the, the feature space? Oh, one, one, right? So this is a one dimensional. So even though you can visualize it in two dimension, but remember, this is very important. This is X, so our feature space is one dimension. On the vertical axis, we have Y. In classification, we had X1 and X2, that was different. That was feature, the, the feature space the dimensionality was two, here's one, okay? So imagine this is your test set. Uh, this is the observation that you wanna pr make prediction uh, and X is equal to eight. So if A is equal to eight, let's, let's start with K is equal to one, right? And K is equal to one. If K is equal to one, what is the, I want you to look at, look at the observations here. So we have five, so look at that. We have two, these are in the train set, right? Two, four, six, 10, and 13. So what is the closest one to eight? Well, I think maybe eight is not a good example. Let me work with seven. Yeah, let's work with seven. So which one is closest to seven? So six is closest, right? So if six is closest, then we're going to report the value of six for observation uh, for X, when X is equal to seven. Is this clear guys? Are you following? Okay. Because K is equal to one. So it's going, we are going to report exactly the value. So average or the value here is the same, right? So this is, we call it, let's call it one nearest neighbor. So the prediction when X is equal to seven is going to be eight. Are we good? Okay. Now let's do two, uh, K is equal to two. If K is equal to two, what are the closest numbers? For seven, uh, yeah, for seven. Yeah, let's, let's focus on this uh, for X T is equal to seven. So when K is equal to two, what are, what are the closest numbers? Six and four. So you have to pick two of them, right? Oh, yeah. Because K is yeah, equal to yeah. two. You expand that radius in this case. Again, this is Euclidean. This is in one dimension, which is just line, the distance, right? So it's, it's going to be equal to six and four. Does everyone see that? These are the closest two numbers. So if it is six and four, then we have, so K is equal to two. 
So the outcome is going to be uh, eight plus eight divided by two. Do, do you see that? I'm, I'm looking at two outputs divided by, so I basically calculate the average. So it's going to be eight. So this observation is going to be, this prediction is going to be both for one NN and two NN, right? Following, so what if K is equal to three? Then this is the one number, this closest one. And then I think one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five. So this 10 is going to be the closest one, right? Wait. Wouldn't, wouldn't it struggle differentiating the two uh, Look at that, we are here, right? So this is the closest one. Then this one. Well, is it four the same distance as ten? Oh, between this one and this one? Well, you can call it two or three. It really doesn't matter. Yeah. It really doesn't matter. So you can call one, two, three, one. Two, so basically, at the end of the day, this is this one, this one, and this one are the closest one. Yeah, but for k equals two is what I was saying. No, for k is equal to three. Uh, for k is equal to two, ah, you're right. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. yeah. So this, this is not the best example, but yeah, yeah imagine but I'm the algorithm. I pick this one by chance. Yeah, yeah, but you're right. Yeah. If I pick the other one on the right, so the average is going to be smaller. Yeah. yeah, very good point, Ryan. Thank you. Uh, but let's say here K is equal to three. So for K is equal to three, what is the outcome? Eight plus eight plus what? Five, Five divided by three, right? Yeah. So 1621 divided by three, seven. So then seven, this is our three nearest neighbor. And we do the same for the rest of case, right? Case equal to four, five, and et cetera. Abraham, question? No, I'm not. good? Okay. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, so here is case equal to uh, three, right? If you do the math for case equal to four, maybe it's going to up and down. But at the end of the day, we have five observations, right? Guys, remember, we have five dots here. If k is equal to five, what do I get? Five bar, exactly. Right. If k is equal to five, I get the y bar. And then for any, again, for if k is equal to five, for any predictions that you want to make for any of these x's, the answer is going to be one simple line. Okay. So let's actually visualize that. If k is equal to five, so the average is going to be what? Six plus eight plus eight plus five plus two divided by five. So I, I should have this number written down somewhere, or I don't. So what's the average? Yeah, so five point eight, right? Yeah. Five point eight. Yeah. So this is five point eight. Basically, <laughs> I know we all can do the math. <laughs> so this is the, always the, the, if k is equal to anything greater than five, the model is going to always predict a line, right? Okay, so this is regression. But if k is equal to one or two or three, it's going to be something like this. Again, it's going to be, for example, any within the neighborhood is going to be, it's going to be very jumpy, right? It depends, right? I hope that this is, so for example, this is for k is equal to one. If I do k is equal to two, it's going to be less jumpy, k is equal to three, less jumpy, and et cetera. Okay. And in this example, when k is equal to five and beyond, it's going to be always equal to a constant line. All right, well, uh, it's going to become easier when we look at some other visualizations, but uh, hopefully you got the idea that what is this doing? So in classification, we calculated the conditional probabilities. We picked the largest one. In regression, you're simply calculating the average for those neighbors. If you have three numbers in the neighborhood, just take the average of the y. If you have five numbers, take the average of the y's and then report it as a prediction for your uh, test set, okay? Uh, all right, so now again, the same story. Let's talk about choice of K, bias variance trade-off. Imagine this is our data set in the train set. If K is equal to one, look at that, how uh, I think jiggly is, is go up and down very quickly, right? Because uh, remember guys, this is feature space is equal to one. So basically I have to, if, if I go from between these two names in this neighborhood, always the answer is going to be this, 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 because K is equal to one. Do you see that? Is this clear? This is the most complex model when K is equal to one. The same story. It is most flexible, most complex. 
So the bias is the smallest and variance is highest. Then you keep increasing K. If you're increasing K, as you can see, the regression line is going to become smoother, smoother, and smoother. So in this example, when K is equal to 50, you see it. Uh, guys, for example, here, you want to make prediction for this guy, right? So let's say X is equal to, I don't know, three. Uh, you have to look at all 50 observations which are closest uh, to this. Uh, maybe, maybe I can find 50 observations here. Then I can report the average. Well, I should be some down here because the average is a small, right? It is right in between, right? So maybe 25 observations here, 25 observations. And then if I take the average, I'll get this number, right? Okay. So here's, again, there's a question for you. Imagine I have 200 blue dots here. If K is equal to, if K is greater than 200, if K is greater than or equal to 200, what's the answer? One simple line, right? So maybe the average is around here. This is for K greater than or equal to 200. All right. Optimal value of K. So for regression analysis, what are the performance metrics? There's only one. So RMSE or MSE, it really doesn't matter. And then, uh, so this is, I, I picked it from my Python. Uh, so that for that reason, I use K, right? So here, because again, if you, if, guys, if you look in the, even if you Google it online or look at, look at the literature, K and N is very, very rarely used for regression analysis, right? Uh, and we're gonna talk about it, why? So for that reason, I couldn't find something in the textbook. So I use my own version. So this is what I generated in Python. We're gonna review it in, in our next class uh, Wednesday. So now be careful. This is K here, it's not one over K. So if I go from right to left, I'm making the model more complex. Are you following? Okay. And I report the RMSE. And uh, again, I, I want to work with the cross-validated version. So RMSE cross-validated. I don't care about the RMSE of the test set or I don't care about the RMSE of the train set at all. The only thing that matters to me is the RMSE of the cross-validation. And I look at uh, where that RMSE is minimized. So maybe it's here, I don't know, maybe five or four. Yeah, maybe, I don't know, somewhere here. Maybe this is four. So the answer is going to be K is equal to four. Does that make sense? All right. So we're gonna do the CD applications in Python in the next class. All right. And so here, if you, if you want to visualize it in three dimension, now, what is, it, what is the dimensionality of the feature space here? Two, very good. I have X1 and X2. So our, my feature space is, is two dimension. Now we are going to make uh, predictions using KNN. So this is KNN regression visualized in three dimension, right? So if I ask a question, so one of them, K is equal to one, the other one, K is equal to 10, which is which? So this is A, B. Which one is K is equal to one? Which one is K is equal to 10? And B is 10. Does everyone see that? So A is, so here K is equal to one. This is K is equal to 10. And you see how beautifully, well, it's not necessarily beautiful here because this is super complex. And it's the variance is going to be super high because if I throw another train set or test set, it's going to do a very poor job. But on average, the beauty of it is that on average is capturing the pattern in the data. That's why the bias is small. Okay. All right. So let's move on. Now let's compare the linear regression versus KNN. So this, this is a very important discussion. And then this is basically where we talk about why in practice people very, very uh, rarely use uh, KNN as a regressor. Okay. So the black curve here in this example is a true relationship. So we know that the true relationship is linear. We know it for a fact, okay? The green dashed line, so here we're, we're going to talk about this one. The green dashed line is KNN MSE test, in mean score error in the test set. And this is our friend OLS MSE, an MSE test of OLS. It's going to be always one number, right? Because OLS is independent of K. I'm plotting K versus OLS MSC. So OLS MSC is going to be always one number, regardless of what, what K you, cho you chose for your KNN regression. Does that make sense? Okay. So, and now let's talk about it. If the true relationship, in the black line, if you know for a fact that the relationship between X and Y is linear, OLS is going to do a way better job. 
than KNN. Why? Because look at that. KNN is unnecessarily, when K is equal to one, look at that. This is ridiculous, K is equal to one. It is unnecessarily doing something like this. This doesn't make any sense, right? This is absolutely overfitting. So it's going to do a very poor job. For that reason, the MSC, the test set is going to be very, very high compared to OLS. So I, I want you to think of this line as OLS, MSC in the test set for OLS. Even if you increase K, it's going to become smoother, but it's still, it's irrelevant, right? It's, it's unnecessarily going up and down when the true relationship is linear, right? So, and as you can see, regardless of the number of K, KNN is always performing worse than OLS. It's always on top of OLS MSC, which is a bad, bad news for KNN regression. Are you following? Okay, now let's make the model. Uh, now let's assume that the true relationship is not linear anymore. It's not black. This is, this is the true relationship. Now let's say the true relationship is nonlinear. See what happens. So this is a very interesting discussion. Okay, now if the true relationship is something like this, I want you to think, look at the black line, the black curve. This is a true relationship, something. Well, it wasn't maybe something like this. So this is a true relationship. If that's the case, you can see there are some points. So let's say here K is equal to, uh, well, what do we have here? So here it's two, here it's five. I don't know, maybe this is three or four, right? K is equal to four. So when K is equal to uh, is, greater than, does everyone follow that when K is greater than four, the KNN is outperforming the linear regression model? Do you see that? Okay, let me back up a little bit here. So let's compare the KNN regression versus OLS. You're looking at the MSC in the test set, right? At some point, so if K is equal to one, still this, uh, the blue one is K is equal to one, Let's say the red one is k is equal to 10. In k is equal to one, there's this amount of unnecessarily going up and down, uh, which basically those are noises that the model is learning. The model is learning from noise, which is bad, right? So k is equal to one, of course, it's going to do a very bad job compared to OLS. But at some point for some values of k, so here, let's say k is equal to four, for some values of k, so k is equal to four and, and, and above, the KNN is outperforming. Look at the MSC, it's below the OLS. So it's outperforming the linear model. Do you see that? Let me know if there's any question, right? And now let's say, look at that. If the true relationship is very nonlinear for any values of K, KNN is outperforming OLS. It's very powerful, right? Because well, what is OLS doing? OLS is doing this. If I want to use simple linear regression model, it's going to do something like that. And we know that here it's over predicting a lot, here is under predicting a ton. Well, the other way around, right? So here is over predicting, here is under predicting. And uh, yeah. And uh, so it's going to do a, a lot worse job uh, compared to KNN. Okay. So at this point, you might, you might get super excited and say that, okay, so it seems that KNN is doing a very good job. And even in regression, if, if the, the relationship between X and Y is nonlinear, uh, but let me see what's the time. Uh, well, I have five minutes. So let's see if I can cover it. But if we're going to talk about it, that's not necessarily the case. That's where the you know, curse of dimensionality is going to kick in. And it's going to completely ruin all these uh, MSE in the test set for KNN. Okay. Because yes, in one, if the, if the question is low dimension, let's say one dimension here or two dimensions, or at most three, you have three features. Uh, and the relationship between uh, feature space and Y is very nonlinear. Yes, KNN is going to do the perfect job. But if the feature goes to four, five, six, the curse of dimensionality is going to kill your KNN regression. And that's going to be very, very exaggerated when it comes to calculating MSC in the test set. So let me stop here because I cannot finish it in four minutes. So let me stop here. Next class, we're going to talk about this curse of dimensionality. But I want you to read through the slides and then, uh, and then let, well, hopefully when you come to the class, we can talk about it uh, faster. But uh, here's just a preview, you know, because you know that what are, what are these dashed lines? 
versus the green ones, right? So if the dimension of the uh, data is one and the, and the relationship is nonlinear, so this is regression. This is class. Okay, again, I'm, I'm gonna talk about it next class, but to give you a preview, uh, if dimension is one, KNN is outperforming, look at that, KNN is outperforming the OLS regardless of the value of K. If I increase the dimension to two, still it's outperforming. If it is three, it is outperforming for most values of K. If it is four, oh, this is outperforming. If the dimension of your question is only 10, you only have 10 feature space, look at that. Canon is completely off. And if it is 20, it is completely off, right? So for, and this is your simple OLS, simple OLS like beta zero plus beta one X one plus beta 20 X 20. It is going to be completely outbid the KNN regression. So for that reason, because of this curse of dimensionality, because remember this is machine learning and many, many uh, problems that you have out there are high dimensions. So people, are, never use KNN as a regressor. But as a classifier, it's very powerful. It is a still very powerful. And even, it's, even as a classifier, it's used um, as a benchmark for some the deep learning models as well. So this is, so, so because, because of that reason, the simplicity and the strength of KNN classifier, even in deep learning, people use it as a benchmark. Okay. If the deep learning models can outbid that model or not. All right, so let's pause here and then uh, we're going to take it from here next class. Okay, is there any questions, guys at home? Good. All right, so let's call it a day. Mm -hmm.